Computer Science 461 Socio-Technical Systems. So today we'll get Module 3 and begin to take by taking a look at socio-technical systems. The information can be found in Chapter 10 of the uh, Somerville text. So the uh, image on this uh, second slide came up as one of the top hits for socio-technical systems when I did the image search for it. I include it here because it encapsulates a few of the main ideas and it's also quite humorous and confusing in its own special way. Uh, so what are these socio-technical systems, since this uh, image doesn't really answer that for us? Uh, but in order to answer what are socio-technical systems, we're going to need to look at systems in general. So, a system is a purposeful collection of interrelated components that work together to achieve some purpose. Now, there are two categories for systems that include software. One are technical computer systems, which really don't have any procedures or processes associated with them. For example, LaTeX or MS Word. There's no business process or no systemic process for using Microsoft Word. It's used in a variety of different contexts. And so that's different from a socio-technical system, which also includes people and processes. For example, the publishing process, going from an idea with the author to the draft of the book, to the review with the editor, to the actual printing of the book. Uh, these socio, and that's a socio-technical system because it does include a technical computer system, such as a word processor or layout system, but it includes everything including the people and the processes. It's non-deterministic and depends on the stability of the objectives. The socio-technical systems also have emergent properties, and let's take a a moment to review these emergent properties from CS460. So, emergent properties are those properties that emerge once the system is created, and we can partition those into two categories. One are functional emergent properties, and these appear when all the parts of the system work together to achieve an example, to achieve an, ex uh, an objective. An example of a functional emergent property is a bicycle or a car becoming a transportation device when it's completely assembled. In other words, it uh, moves, and that's something that emerges as uh, something that it can do functionally once it's all put together. Non-functional emergent properties are things that indicate the behavior of the system in its operational environment. For example, reliability, safety, security, performance, or its uh, volume size. Um, and for uh, reliability and other uh, non-functional emergent properties, it can be a bit tricky. Uh, for example, with reliability, you can see cascading failures throughout the system um, when it's, uh, as it's dependent on component reliability, and so there are three related influences on the overall reliability. One, hardware, two, software, and three, the human operator. All these are interrelated. Screw-ups in one area can certainly cause screw-ups in another. So. One of the discussion questions in Chapter 10 is explain why other systems within a systems environment can have unanticipated effects on the functioning of the system. And here we have a picture of a butterfly uh, eventually causing a hurricane, which was taken from uh, James Gleick's uh, Chaos. And basically the butterfly can have an impact on the uh, entire weather system, although that uh, doesn't frequently happen. Uh, for systems, though, the interface between two systems can cause this type of effect. For example, one system is upgraded to have new data format for production data. The accounting system uses that data will also need to be updated to receive data in the new format. And changes to the business process may require changes to uh, both those computer systems. Dealing with all the aspects of the socio-technical system is called systems engineering. So let's take a look at systems engineering, and it's the activity of specifying, designing, implementing, validating, deploying, and maintaining socio-technical systems. It's concerned with the services provided by the system, the constraints on its construction and operations, and the ways in which it is used. It usually follows a waterfall model because of the need for parallel development of the different parts of the system, although not always, and there are certainly parts of it that are not waterfall oriented. But it's also interdisciplinary, which can create some politics and misunderstandings within the organization. In terms of politics, Somerville gives a nice example with underworked civil engineers on an air traffic control system. The engineers may advise the best solution is to build additional radar stations instead of modifying the software, because that keeps them in their jobs and doesn't make them overly busy. Uh, Somerville indicates the waterfall model used in 
systems engineering was actually an influence on Royce's waterfall, so it may have predated the uh, one that was actually documented for software engineering. So let's take a look at this uh, systems engineering process, and again you can see that it does have a waterfall-like structure. Um, Start with the requirement definition, go to system design, subsystem development, system integration, installation, evolution, and decommissioning. So let's take a look at each phase of this model. Uh, phase one, the requirements definition. There are three types of requirements for systems engineering. One are the abstract functional requirements. Um, for the overall system, you want the requirements to be abstract rather than detailed. The details will be given at the subsystem level, but for the overall system, you want them to be abstract. You need to specify the system properties, uh, particularly the emergent ones, uh, talking about performance and volume, etc. And then characteristics the system must not uh, exhibit. Example of this would be uh, presenting the user with too much information in the case of an air traffic control system. Let's look at the system design phase. Now this one is actually a process in itself. And you may have to go back and forth between these activities. Uh, I know it's hard to see the text, but you can look at the uh, textbook to see it more clearly. Part one, partition the requirements, analyze the requirements and organize them into related groups, identify subsystems that can meet these requirements, make sure the appropriate requirements are given to the appropriate subsystem. Um, and then specify the subsystem functionality um, and then define the subsystem interfaces so that they all connect to one another. You can also view this as a spiral model. Uh, it looks like problem definition comes third here but it should probably really come first. Um, it's kind of confusing as to uh, where you would actually start where you would actually start. Uh, I think you need to define the problem before you begin to uh, elicit the requirements. After you've uh, defined the system and put the system together comes the system operation. And the processes that are used, involved in using the system for its defined purposes are the operational processes. Um, the key benefit of having system operators um, and people associated with the system is that uh, we have a unique capability of being able to respond effectively to unexpected situations even when they've never had experiences like these before. Uh, of course, operation uh, does also involve the uh, possibility of human error. And as HAL 9000 once said, it can only be attributable to human error. Uh, in fact, it will almost always occur, and there are two viewpoints. Um, the person approach, the errors fall to the person making the screw up, and then the system approach, which is understand how and why the system did not trap the error. Obviously, Somerville prefers the uh, system approach. Um, I think it depends on the type of screw up to a large degree, but um, there we go. And Reason, um, who's a researcher in this area, actually has something called the Swiss cheese analogy, where you have different barriers to preventing the uh, system failure. And you can think of them like Swiss cheese. There's holes in every way that you can specify things. These are the latent conditions at every barrier. And when they align, they cause the system failure. So, and what you want to do is you want to make it so that the holes can't line up or can only line up on very rare occasions. After operation, we come to system evolution. And so systems do evolve and do uh, sometimes eventually get decommissioned, but a lot of times they become what's known as legacy systems. And these are socio-technical systems that have been developed using older obsolete technology. Now, they do tend to still be crucial to the operation of a business, and it's uh, often too risky to discard these systems or get rid of them altogether. Uh, bank customer accounting systems, they still use mainframe programming and uh, COBOL to a large extent. Aircraft maintenance systems are also quite old, and production tracking software, most automobile manufacturers, is also quite old. Uh, so they can constrain new business processes, and they can consume a high portion of company budgets to maintain them. Uh, there is a, actually a group at Ford Motor Company that's in charge of maintaining all their legacy systems. And some of these just have a single small group that uses them. A lot of them are located in third world countries due to lack of new hardware at these organizations. Um, another good example is the U.S. Geological Survey having piles of earthquake data on tape and shoe boxes. So 
you know, you can't have legacy systems that still um, reside here in the 21st century. It's not always easy to get rid of these. So components that make up legacy systems, hardware, some of this can be obsolete mainframe hardware, example IBM 3270, support software. Uh, you may rely on support software from suppliers who are no longer in business. Application software could be written in older programming languages but still around. Um, lots of COBOL and Fortran code is uh, still around. Application data can often be incomplete and inconsistent. Business processes um, for legacy systems may be constrained by the software structure and functionality and business policies and rules may be implicitly embedded in the system software so they can't evolve as well. Uh, examples of business processes being constrained by a system can be found throughout the uh, University of Hawaii system. Um, for example, La Lima or Curriculum Central certainly constrain how we conduct business here at the University of Hawaii. Uh, not that those are legacy systems, but they do constrain us in some ways. Uh, next time we'll take a look at software reuse, which is uh, chapter 16 in Somerville.